Thank you for coming to the next NCAR seminar series, the next in the NCAR, NCAR seminar series. Um, we have a special guest today, which is why we're at a special time. His name is Dean Hively, and he is out of the, uh, he's USGS based at the ARS Lower Mississippi Gulf Water Center in Beltsville. And he is going to be speaking to us about satellite remote sensing to detect cover crop performance, a case study in the Mississippi alluvial plain. And we're going to go ahead and do the share screen thing. All right, come on over. Please mute yourselves and turn off your cameras, and you will have time for questions at the end. I'm going to move my system for the little thing here. I think you. Right yeah. here. Yeah. I'm going I'm trying to get connection here and then you might need to bleep. Yeah. Great. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dean Hively. I'm down here from Washington, DC, with my friend Brian Lamb, who also works on this project. Um, I have a kind of a one foot in each world type of position. I report to the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Lower Mississippi Gulf Water Science Center. They are Rigby here in the in the rear is the branch chief for our branch, and so we interact a lot with uh, Gulf scientists. However, I'm posted as I have been for over a decade to USDA Agricultural Research Service up in Beltsville, Maryland. So, the mothership of USDA up in DC. Um, at the Hydrology Remote Sensing Lab. I did my PhD up at Cornell. I did an ARS postdoc for four years in Beltsville. And then I switched to working for with the US Geological Survey and kind of never left the building. So it's a good hybrid position between the resources of ARS and agricultural research and the resources of USGS in public research and, and outreach. I'm here to talk about uh, projects that we have going on remote sensing of winter cover crops and of conservation tillage. We've been working in this area for over a decade, so a lot of interesting results to discuss, mainly developed in the Chesapeake Bay watershed up in Maryland and Delaware area. And then for the last year, we've been collaborating with Lindsay down here at ARS and doing a pilot project in the Mississippi alluvial plain. So, I'm going to discuss that as well. So a multi-agency project, primarily USGS and USDA ARS, a lot of connection with Maryland Department of Agriculture, Delaware Conservation Districts, uh, Maryland Conservation Districts, and then the Precision Sustainable Agriculture Network run out of the Sustainable Ag Systems Lab up in Beltsville. So winter cover crops, as you know, they are a popular conservation practice being promoted heavily for soil health, um, crop diversity, alleviation of compaction, soil aggregate stability, etc. Up in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, where we have a heavy impact of human population density and agricultural inputs to water quality, really the focus is on agricultural nitrogen. So reducing nitrate leaching by growing over the winter season, pulling the excess nitrogen out of the soil prior to the winter leaching period, maintaining it and releasing it the next summer. So tightening up the nitrogen cycle. If you look at the uh, survey, the agricultural survey from 2017, you see percent of crop acreage in cover crops. Um, our area leads the nation and it's really because of the Chesapeake Bay program you see here, the gray outline is Chesapeake Bay watershed and the states surrounding it from New York down to Virginia has a high degree of cover crop implementation, largely because of cost share, but also because it's being promoted as a practice to keep nitrogen out of our estuary in the Chesapeake. Um, various other reasons and pro projects promoting cover crops across the nation, as you know. So Maryland has 43% uh, of its row crop agriculture in cover crops. Relative to states like Mississippi or the Midwest, we don't have as many acres of agriculture, but a lot of it's in cover crop. 
And you can see a lot of the implementation uh, was between 2009 and 2011. We went from 200,000 to 400,000 acres of cover crop in Maryland, basically due to cost share programs. We're fortunate to collaborate with the Maryland Department of Agriculture, uh, which allows us privacy protected access to their enrollment records. We worked with them over time to digitize the boundaries of cover crop fields so we know where the fields are. And our focus of remote sensing really is on performance, how to use satellites to look at the amount of biomass, fractional ground cover, and nitrogen uptake associated with this. And they have a variable incentive rate trying to promote practices that grow strong cover crops. And we can provide the scientific background to see whether that's working. Why? Well, here's a study from our region showing that in 1988, we shifted from a continuous corn crop, um, either with or without plow tillage, that was um, not using cover crops with soil nitrate up to 25 parts per million, started using a rye cover crop, planted well, growing well every year. And you can see it really did deplete lysimeter measured groundwater nitrate. So that's the rationale. How does it work? This is a bunch of field data we've collected. You can see on the y-axis the cover crop biomass and on the x-axis soil nitrate. So you have one range where you have in red failed cover crops. The cover crop was planted, the biomass is low, and nitrates are high. In the upper left, you have successful cover crops where you have abundant biomass and soil nitrate below five milligrams per kilogram. And then in the lower left, you can also have a nitrogen limited cover crop. You can have a cover crop growing where there's no nitrate in the soil. That's a positive environmental outcome, but it doesn't help your soil health at all. So on-farm performance is variable. Every one of these fields was subsidized by the Maryland Cover Crop Program. Lower right was aerial seeded and failed. Upper left is a dairy farm growing rylage, very abundant, but high soil nitrate. So there's a lot of variability in the landscape. And so our research question is how can we address that variability and look at how agronomic practices affect outcomes of winter cover crops? by combining knowledge of what's going on on the fields with the satellite remote sensing. So if you look at an image of a farm landscape here, near infrared is in displayed in red. So the brighter red here, we have more vegetation. And so you can clearly see differences in crop management, differences amount of vegetation on the fields. And you'll hear a lot about the normalized difference vegetation index. It's been used since the 70s. It works very well. And it's a ratio of near infrared to red absorbance. So as plants grow, they absorb red, they reflect near infrared. And you can use that to distinguish from background soil, which is done by the green and the dashed lines. So more vegetation is more NDVI. That's a simplistic mm, conversation. It also is affected by soil moisture and background soil color and other confounding factors. We're fortunate also to know where the cover crops are. And so here we know the field boundaries of fields enrolled in the cover crop program, about 25,000 uh, fields per year of data. And then we know this list of agronomic information about each field, farmer reported information about what species, when it was planted, how it was planted, et cetera. And so we're able to use that to make the remote sensing biomass or ground cover as an outcome variable and use all the agronomic data as predictors. Our main satellite choice of tools is the harmonized combination of Landsat and Sentinel. As you know, Landsat's produced by the US government going back to the 70s. There are two Landsats up currently, eight and nine. They come over about every eight days and that's used free of charge. The European Space Agency has two satellites, Sentinel-2 with sensors similar to Landsat, but not exactly the same. That's at 20 meters. So by combining those two sensors, we have about a five day revisit period. But if any of you are using Landsat and Sentinel, 
you can't really just pull the surface reflectance for each of those and combine them. You need the harmonized product, which is currently not available on Google Earth Engine, but it is available from the NASA Earth Explorer. And what this does is just provides some spectral and mathematical calibrations to make both of those sensors play well together so that an NDVI from one is similar to an NDVI for the other. So that's important to use the HLS product. Each time it passes over, it's a snapshot in time. It could be cloudy or inundated or snow covered. And you can test for that with the cloud masks and pull out clear pixels and look at repeat frequency. Since we know where the field boundaries are, we buffer in to remove edge effects. We take an average of NDVI within each field. We're not really looking at spatial variability in this study. We're looking for, on average, how's the cover crop doing in that field? And with that, we're able to mathematically look at green updates, how strong the green up is coming on, the maximum performance seasonally, and when the cover crop terminates. And it looks kind of like this. This would be an example. NDVI, the vegetation index on the y-axis, calendar date over the winter time on the x-axis. So you can see here, we're detecting a bump. Well, first of all, the black triangles are sentinel. The circles are, are, are sentinel and the black triangles are Landsat. We're doing mathematical interpolation to get a daily growth curve. We can see where it starts increasing. We have the green up. We can pull a maximum winter performance. You often see NDVI drop down over the winter from cold weather, then the spring green up, and then a termination event, and then the onset of the summer corn crop following that. So we're able to calculate this for each of 25,000 fields across wow. the state of Maryland. We spend a lot of time out on farm fields, courtesy of coordination through the soil conservation districts to collect biomass data and ground cover data to calibrate these measurements. And we're able to come up with estimations of biomass or estimations of ground cover. Biomass, I will say, we're good at measuring from bare soil up to about 1,000, 1,500 kilograms per hectare. Once you have a closed canopy cover, all you can really say is there's a lot of biomass there. So we can't really tell the difference between 2,000 and 4,000 kilograms per hectare of biomass. Other tools can be used to do that. For ground cover, similarly, it's good measures up to about 80% ground cover, after which it kind of saturates. To estimate nitrogen content, we can do that directly from um, field samples, showing here that as biomass increases, nitrogen content decreases. I'm only talking about cereal crops here, right? So this doesn't include any legumes. Um, so as the reproductive stage begins at high biomass, you get a lower nitrogen concentration. With the Sentinel, not the Landsat, it has a red edge band where we're actually beginning to be able to directly measure the nitrogen content of the cover crop itself. So this is work in progress. We're going to have a paper coming out in a few months, but initial results are pretty good that we're going to be able to measure nitrogen content in the cover crop directly. Is that legume and grass together? Yeah, this is only trick grass. Cereal crops, wheat, barley, trinkale, and rye is pretty much what we're touching on. Um, as I say, the Maryland Cover Crop Program has really focused on cereals. As time has evolved, it's starting to have more brassicas, tillage radish, cereal legume mixes. We're developing calibration curves for those, but they're not in the bag yet. So that's what satellite analysis of cover crops can do. What it cannot do, as I said, saturates at high biomass. You can't really distinguish species mixes, although you could infer it could be a clover from a high nitrogen content if we're measuring nitrogen content. And then an important point, we can't really tell the difference between a cover crop and a weedy field. So from the soil erosion point of view, there's nothing wrong with weeds. Really, there's nothing wrong with weeds as long as they're not interfering with your commodity crop harvest, right? They're providing a diverse environment. But uh, we have a hard time distinguishing weedy fields from cover crop fields, and we'll have more discussion of that as the, as the presentation goes on. 
In order to answer those questions, you can't answer with satellites and to have uh, more options. We're also working with hyperspectral imagery, tractor-mounted sensors, the Precision Sustainable Ag Network is thinking, if you're going through the field spraying, let's have camera technology that's identified where the weed patches are among the cover crops or where the clover took versus where the cereals took. So that's a big put. And then using the various sensors to collect field data to work with the satellites. So these tools allow us to look at what factors are affecting cover crop success in our region. So we can talk about species choice. Some might be more cold tolerant for growth in the fall. Some might winter kill. Some might simply perform better. Down on the right, you see barley in our area. It really toasts off during the winter, but performs well. Planting date, same field, cover crop planted at two dates. Obviously, if you plant earlier, you capture more fall growing weather. Planting method, aerial seeding, good to get on early for early planting date, but often fails due to lack of soil moisture. So really only good in wet years. Seed soil contact in a no-till or light-till drill tends to produce a better cover crop, but is more expensive and slow to plant. Termination date, how late do you grow it out in the springtime? Has big implications for a springtime growth accumulation. Also has implications for whether the farmer is going to be able to handle it in the spring and whether you have any crossover of pest process. So a very active area of field plot research at ARS is looking at termination dates. And then finally, termination method, what you do with it. We can detect this in some ways from the satellite remote sensing. So those are the tools. I'm just gonna take about four slides to run through some example results. Uh, this from a recent paper in agronomy, if you want the full data set, Looking at Maryland, and here's the distribution of fields across the state. Most of our fields are on the eastern shore. We're looking at colored bars being late terminated and clear bars being early terminated. So farmers enrolled in the program are able to terminate anytime after March 1st. There's a $10 per acre incentive to terminate late after May 1st. About a third of farmers are taking that incentive. So the question is, how well is that program working? You can see in each case, growing it farther into the spring obviously accumulates biomass. In this case, we can calculate how much. The other thing coming out of this is that triticale is the big winner in terms of biomass production, but wheat is the dominant cover crop species. About 70% of Maryland cover crops are wheat, and we'd like to shift this more towards other species. Farmers are used to growing wheat around here, and they're saving their own seed, but it's not the most effective cover crop. Late termination, we were able to measure that incentive increased biomass by 69%, nitrogen uptake by 48% across the state. You could argue that wintertime uptake is more important than springtime uptake because it prevents leaching. That's probably true, but this is a big uptake of spring mineralized nitrogen. A little view of planting methods as expected. The drilling methods have a higher biomass. Then aerial, worst performer, and various other broadcast methods of practice. And also, we're working directly with Maryland Department of Agriculture since COVID. It's difficult for them to get out there and spot check to verify that farmers are terminating and not growing the cover crops out for harvest. There is a legal requirement for them to do a certain amount of detection of that. What we do is we run a satellite analysis every two weeks using the most recent image. We send them a list of termination dates that we've detected on fields. They compare that to the farmer reported termination dates. If it's a close match, they release the payment without having to go visit the field. The conservation district agents will love us for this. We're saving them a lot of time to go out in the field. We're doing work in Delaware, looking at different incentive structures in the different counties, how that affects outcomes. The one county that has an early planting incentive has more early planting. And one, interestingly, that allows the, the farmers, gives them a payment in the fall to plant the cover crop, but then in the spring, 
The farmers can decide to grow it out as a commodity crop, in which case it's like an unfertilized fall, fall unfertilized commodity crop versus a cover crop. They actually have a lot more drilling in that county, which has a lot more biomass. So interesting results. Here's the relationship between planting date and biomass. Some states in the Chesapeake Bay region, we don't know where the cover crops are already. We developed a tool that combines the cropland data layer to look at what crop type is where, and our satellite biomass estimates to look at the amount of vegetation. And we came up with some thresholds here, minimal, low, medium, and high biomass. And here's a distribution of cornfields in Talbot County. So the high dark green, that's a cornfield with high biomass following corn harvest. And the brown is a cornfield with low biomass following corn harvest. So we're able to combine the USDA cropland data layer with our satellite analysis to look at this. We did that up in Pennsylvania in support of an extension program. And we could see that from 2009 to 2012, the amount of bare soils in brown here went down as the amount of vegetative soil went up. And we did a lot of checking to make sure this wasn't just due to weather trends. Warmer winters definitely have a greener landscape. We have a paper about that. But in this case, about the same amount of growing degrees went into each one of these image dates, and we're pretty certain. That's cover crops, science background. I'm going to give just an overview of um, our work with crop residue, non photosynthetic vegetation, and then I'm going to shift into talking about our Mississippi pilot study. So non photosynthetic vegetation, this is dead vegetation in the non agricultural landscape, this could be brush or woody residue or grasses that are senescent in the agricultural landscape, this is usually talking about crop residue. So non photosynthetic vegetation on the surface of the soil obviously armors the soil against raindrop impact and erosion. Also can um, provide a mulch that reduces uh, moisture loss during the summer growing season. Lots of benefits. And that's one of the reasons for the big push towards no-till agriculture. It's variable across the landscape as a result of tillage practices and cropping practices, as well as weather patterns. So how could we use satellite remote sensing to measure crop residue? If you look at most of the national use of say the Optus operational tillage information system, most of the people are using Landsat type multispectral satellites to try to measure it. And I apologize, these brown lines aren't easy to see, but this is the width of a Landsat 8, 1600 um, band SWIR 1, and this is the width of SWIR 2. This is the visible spectrum from our visual, visualization, um, you know, blue, red, green into the near infrared. These are atmospheric moisture absorption bands. We've cut out shortwave infrared one and shortwave infrared two around 2100 nanometers. And so the blue is a soil, the black is crop residue, and the and green is vegetation. So here's that jump in NDVI in the green line in the visible near infrared that we use to measure the vegetation. Soil and residue are rather featureless. That's why they're both brown to our eyes in the visible range. When you get out of the SWIR 2 around 2100 nanometers, you see vegetation has a peak similar to soil. And then there are these two absorption features out here associated with lignin and cellulose absorption. And Craig Doctory at the Hydrology and Remote Sensing Lab has done a lot of pioneering work looking at cellulose absorption indices using hyperspectral data. What we've done is we've taken some satellites, Rho V3, Aster, that can measure these gray bands and therefore measure the depth of lignocellulose absorption, finding that very much superior to Landsat. The best you can do with Landsat is a ratio of SWIR1 and SWIR2, which detects residue, but it's very sensitive to soil moisture. And it really depends on brightness differences between the soil and the vegetation. So the older the crop residue, 
or the wetter the crop residue or the more soil on top of it, the less you're going to detect it. In contrast, if we use a narrow spectra satellite with multiple bands in this region to measure the depth of these absorption features, we can get a much better accuracy at mapping crop residue. And so Brian and I have done a substantial amount of work on this in collaboration with some other scientists. Here's an example from the Eastern shore of Maryland where we have a collaborating farm. We've taken a lot of field measurements of crop residue. So field residue on the y-axis uh, of satellite index for the cellulose absorption on the X. And you can see we get quite a good fit. So our score is a 0.94 in this case. What you do when you're mapping the landscape is A, you have interference from vegetation. So if the field has a cover crop on it, you don't map residue on that field. You can't see the residue. So first we mask to NDVI 0.3. So anything in green here, we're displaying the amounts of vegetation. Anything in shades of brown, we're displaying the amounts of crop residue. So you can see different management strategies from low residue to high residue, about zero to 80% residue cover in this case. So a good result using WorldView 3 satellite. It is free to USGS. It's a little difficult to task and it's small. So I think here's it might the be Eastern Shore. Dean, I think it might be all federal employees, actually. Free to all federal employees? Yeah, okay. So. so you are able, as ARS employees, to task Worldview 3. And we can help you with that if you're interested. It's a 14 kilometer put, footprint, right? So this covers the area of our study farm, but not a whole lot more. What we've done is developed methods to accurately characterize residue cover on that study area and then use all of the pixels from that to calibrate a machine learning to a larger Landsat footprint in red here collected on a similar day within a week. And what we're able to do with that is actually increase our precision of predicting crop residue at the landscape level from up to about 0.88 to 0.92, depending on the variations in the image. And Brian, do you remember what the NDTI was for that 0.64 or something like that? Um, Basically, a jump in R squared from around 0.6 to around 0.9. Okay, so a substantial increase in this method. It's a little more difficult than just downloading a Landsat and categorizing it, but it's working well. So that's the work we've been doing with residue. Um, interestingly, in this worldview three, it was happening while center pivot irrigation was underway. And so these fields, a quarter of the field had been irrigated that morning and the rest hadn't. We made some assumptions that crop residue was consistent across that field and were able to come up with some water compensation. So here we have two peaks in a field based on whether the, um, it's a, a dry or a wet pixel. And after our calibration, we have one peak. So we're going from this type of analysis to here. So that was pretty interesting. So water still does affect these indices. Our final capstone piece of this, we've been working with the Landsat project team that's working on Landsat Next. So right now there's a Landsat 8 and 9. At the end of this decade, there'll be a Landsat 10, now called Landsat Next for the moment. And it's going to have a lot more spectral bands. It's going to have about 20 bands instead of five or six. So uh, good development. And um, we led a team looking at non synthetic vegetation and have come up with some recommendations of the best band placement and spectral width for that and are excited to have that impact. So by 2032, we're going to have very accurate measures of crop residue across the landscape. 2030. Two years so they kind of <laughs> end of the decade. Right. Great. Any questions so far on any of that basic introduction? All right. Take a breath. We're about to talk about this. You're doing neat stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Good. My goal was to have a half hour to talk about Mississippi, and that's right where we're at. So a lot of interest in the lower in the 
Mississippi alluvial plain, um, both within our laboratory at USGS and obviously uh, here at ARS. We were able to work with Lindsay starting about a year ago and her technicians were, um, were appreciative that they were able to collect roadside data for us. This is the first time Brian and I have been down to this region to really view the landscape with our own eyes. And I'm thinking this afternoon, we're gonna learn a lot by driving around with these folks. But um, for the moment, we've been working with data transmitted to us uh, beginning on March 11th, 2022. They surveyed 62 fields around two farms they work on. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that data. And then we analyzed that, had some back and forth discussion, improved our methods and what we were looking for. And then very recently, January 30th, sampled another 152 fields. So I'll be re presenting results from both of those samples. Again, we use that HLS data product from Landsat and Sentinel. We collaborate with various people looking at field boundary layers. A uh, good one comes from Indigo Agriculture. So we're able to look at field boundaries associated with these cover crop samples from that. And then our objectives is identification of where the cover crop fields are. This isn't something that's been our specialty, but we've been doing quality control with several groups who do do this type of work. So um, it's an interesting area to be working in now. Um, once we've identified where the cover crop fields are with our calibration data, then we're able to use that to scale up to an analysis of county scale, where we can say it looks like this many acres in the county are in cover crops and this many are not. And then basically to test our methods developed in the Chesapeake down here in a very different setting. For one thing, we have really sandy soils and we don't have much surface water. So we're finding out that's having an impact. So from the two samplings, March 11th, the fields were scored as cover crop versus bare, 12 cover crop fields and 50 bare. Biomass levels were low, medium, high. Residue levels, low, medium, high. A couple of geolocated photos, and that was the data set. Going through that, we discovered that we really need to be looking at this cover crop versus weeds distinction. And so we added in two more categories for weedy and commodity cover crop, and we doubled or tripled the amount of data. And again, we added in a couple more categories for biomass and residue. So here are examples of things that you would see if you walk out the door here, where you have your um, ridge tillage systems with bare soil, weeds, cover crops, and commodity crops. In March 11th, um, one was up by Ruleville on a farm that Lindsay's team works on. What you see here is two color codes. The black center indicates high biomass, a gray and white center, low biomass, and then the circle around the outside indicates whether it's cover crop black versus bare white. So you see, high biomass cover crops in the center, and you see high biomass non-cover crops on the edge and varieties like that. And then a similar data collection around Clark scale. So pretty limited data set, but a nice contrast that we could work with. In the background here, we have NDVI. And so you can see the non-agriculture areas tend to be heavy vegetation. And then the shades of green in the agricultural fields indicate how much biomass in those fields. And then the black field boundaries were developed by Indigo from actual remote sensing. Did a quite nice job, really. We're able to create this type of a growth curve for each field, at least as a post-mortem after the cover crop season is done. What you see here at the left is the previous crop drying down, coming down to a background NDVI. Around 0.2.3 is usually bare soil. We see a green up event with biomass increasing until January. There was a pretty good cold snap that year, which knocks the NDVI down, spring growth coming on, and then a spring termination, maybe through herbicide, and then growth of the following crop. And the dashed line is the date that the survey data were collected. And so we're able to use our calibrations to calculate. So on the left here, 
This was scored by the field staff as a cover crop with medium residue and high biomass. We estimate the NDVI is 0.47, which amounts to about 705 kilograms per hectare biomass and about 40% ground cover on that field. Those calibrations are developed in Maryland, so take it with a grain of salt. And we're able to estimate that this field was had a green up on November 1st and a termination mid March. So we did that for each field. We pulled the maximum spring NDVI values. So the maximum from this peak NDVI, and we average that across fields based on the classes. What we see on the left is NDVI versus biomass, low biomass, medium, and high. The color here is brown for bare and green for color cover crop. You see there's a lot of overlap. Some of these low biomass bare fields actually have vegetation on them. And the cover crops tended toward high biomass, but a bunch of overlap. If you summarize it without the low, medium, high, here are your bare fields and your cover crop fields with some overlap. So that's that weedy cover crop interference. So having an example of a distinction that's easy to make, here's a high biomass cover crop versus a low biomass bare field. I would say that these are easy to distinguish, right? We can say this had a High NDVI, this had a low NDVI, that was cup crop, this is bare field. In this case, however, here's a medium biomass cover crop. So this was scored as a cover crop by the field survey, and it has an NDVI of around 0.42 on March 11. And here's a field scored as bare, which has an NDVI of 0.45. You can't tell those apart. Remember, this first year, we hadn't thought about weeds. So bare, in this case, means bare weedy, I believe. We use this data to try to develop a logic framework for extrapolating to the landscape. So we came up with some NDVI thresholds from either the survey date or before and after, when the green update for the field was, and whether we detected a determination. And we said, anything that meets those conditions is scored as cover crop. This identified 19 of the 62 fields, which included all 12 cover crop fields, but it also included seven bare fields. So not really great, still some overlap there. Not bad, but similarity of cover crops and weeds is problematic. If we look at this and we say within each field boundary, if 40% or more is scored as cover crop, we call it cover crop for the field then we can map it on an even field management area. And if you like, you can extrapolate that up to all of Sunflower County, where the fields and cover crops are. And then if you were confident enough in that result, you could bring in the cropland data layer and start looking at what percent of cornfields were in cover crops, for example. We haven't gone there yet because we're still not confident about that cover crop weeding separation. In terms of crop residue, here's the same March 11th image as an NDTI, the tillage index. You see variability in the landscape. You see variability in survey residue cover. What I've learned in the last two days driving through the Olympia Plain, is there's not that much residue down here. So I'm interested to find out today what high residue really means. And in terms of our results, we're really not seeing a separation. So here's low, medium, high residue and NUTI. This is for the full data set. Here's for non vegetated fields only. So cutting anything out with an NDVI that's above 0.4. Not seeing a good separation. NDTI is very closely correlated to moisture content, though. So it's probably just too wet for NDTI Landsat to work here. So better to use World B3. So we went back and said, okay, how can we work with Lindsay's team to improve this? The way we did is we took an image from January 20th, we looked and we digitized fields that we asked them to visit. So instead of just working on their research farms, we identified a lot of green patches in the landscape that looked like they could be cover crop or weeds. We asked them to survey and this kind of distinguish between cover crop and weeds and add commodity crops as well. So we were able to provide a data sheet. 
and a Google map and some instructions. We'll get feedback today about how easy that was to work with. And here are the results. So now we have four biomass categories from minimum biomass to high. You probably can't read this, but 0.246 of NDVI. And so we're seeing certainly as biomass increases, NDVI increases, a good trend there. And then if we look at our crop types, bear now, since it's not weedy bear, is low NDVI. Commodity cover crop, quite high. Drilled crop, probably planted to eat earlier with a better intention, has good biomass. Cover crops and weeds, still quite a lot of overlap. The color here in the greens and yellows is low, medium, and high biomass, and cover crop and weedy types still overlapping. So a simple NDVI analysis is not distinguishing those. But now we know because we can tell the data from the field data. So here's an example of what bare fields look like. Very low vegetation, background soil NDVI. Commodity cover crop, high vegetation, high NDVI. Those are no-brainers. We can separate those two categories. Here are a variety of photos that were scored as cover crop fields. And here were a variety of weedy fields. I can understand why the satellite's having a hard time distinguishing those. Probably the lower cover crop fields is one of the ones that separates and the patchy ones aren't. So that led us to think, what else can we pull in to add to NDVI? If we look at a moisture index, very similar, same bands as the NDTI. We're starting to get a little, a little separation between cover crops and weeds using the moisture index. So, that moisture index is sensitive to soil moisture and vegetative water content, not perfect. If we look at a graph here with NDVI on the y-axis and when the, this index on the red, the brown are the bare soils, the green are the commodities, easy to separate. The yellow is weeds and the blue is cover crop, right? So by having NDTI pull here and wetness index here, the lower wetness index values tend to associate with weeds. And we still have a mix of weeds and cover crops here, but fewer overlaps. So we're 30% we're toward winning the game with them. Tillage again, in this um, case, had similar results of really not having any similar any separation with tillage. I would say this is most likely due to water and we should start thinking about worldview three. Conclusions from the Mississippi study. Separation of bear versus commodity versus cover crop plus weeds, those three classes we can do, no problem. Separation of cover crop and weeds is still a bit problematic and some work remains. And tillage with Landsat is not working, not tillage, sorry, I take back crop residue cover, often associated with tillage, but crop residue cover distinction isn't really working. That could be due to a, a low range of variability in the field data, or that could be due more likely to all of the standing water in the furrows. Next steps, we're going to continue collecting imagery through this season. We're going to talk with Lindsay's team about whether it would make sense to do one more survey in April to increase the data set. And we're hoping that as the season progresses, maybe the cover crops and weeds will start to separate. Maybe the cover crop weeds will grow better and the weeds will senesce. Unsure. Um, soil color seems to be fairly uniform around here, but if you have variability, you want to account for it. And then wetness. As we're driving around today, I'm going to be looking for fields where there's standing water in the furrows versus the water's below the soil surface, because I think those two surfaces will respond differently for the satellites. We can integrate some crop type from the crop one data layer and crop rotations where the cover crops fit in. If we get to the point where we really like this, then we can start integrating field biomass data anywhere people have biomass crop cuts from these fields. We can start developing a Mississippi specific calibration between NDVI and biomass and ground cover. When we like the product, we can start looking at county totals, and that's where we're at. So thank you, and a big thank you to Lindsay and all of her folks for collecting field data for us to work with. And that's it.
I'd love to get to know all of you better and hear questions. Maybe when you ask a question, you could also introduce yourself and what you're doing. Any questions in the room first before I go to the audience? Awesome. Sir, hey, my name is Amilcar Vargas. I'm a PhD student working with Dr. Colson in sprinkle irrigation. So I have a, lately I've been walking a lot through the fields, especially during the winter and springtime. And I have noticed that fields that were have the same crop during the growing season, like let's say corn, but uh, we have it in different times and they prepare the soil, they make the beds in different times. But I my point is. I see a difference when uh, the same crop residue doesn't seem the same within the same field because they were prepared, the, the, may, the beds were prepared in different dates. So in the beginning, I thought, I asked the farmer, and I said, hey, did we plant a different crop here like soybean and corn? Because one part of the field had a lot of crop residue, and then the other part of the field didn't have a, like a lot, a lot of crop residue on the beds. And he said, no. The, what you're seeing, Amilcar, is like the, we, we made the beds in a different time for the same field. Like substantially different? Like yes. months apart? Yes. Well, I don't know. I don't we know. But apart. what he told me is like that was the rain amount that we got. Yeah. It seemed like uh, the, the heavy events kind of wash away a lot of the crop residue from the first the first time bed that were made okay. versus the other one. Okay. That's one observation. The other observation that I have made is when you have different crop residue amounts, of course, between crops during the growth season. Right. We have uh, cotton, uh, soybean, and corn. Right. I have noticed that you see more residues or in corn yeah. versus soybean. Absolutely. There's less crop residue in soybean. But another thing that I've been thinking, listening to you is like, in cotton, usually they still leave the stocks. Mm -hmm. So that could be influenced what you are reading to because the stuff they are left and they are kind of part of big right. compared to corn and soybean. So I'm wondering if you're gonna make that into the model because it's different and even when you are walking right on, into the field. You it's it's you so they're all, all really good points. And I think you need to distinguish the agronomy that leads to the crop residue outcome versus the measurement of what's there. We can measure what's there. You can interpret what got us there if you know all of those details, right? Yeah, good to know, good to know. And certainly everywhere, soybean residue decays faster than Yes, anymore. that's what I I had an online question. Uh, Daryl Chastain, our plant physiologist, is asking how do you think you would approach the water in the furrows versus that water issue in the furrow issue? Hey. If you think in terms of a 20, 30 meter pixel, it all gets blended together, right? So if you have an inundated field where there's a sheen of water across the surface, you're gonna have a negative NDVI. If you have green vegetation across the surface, you might have a green NDVI of 0.5. If you have a quarter water and three quarters, or a quarter water, quarter soil, half vegetation, you're gonna have an NDVI of around point three, right? Let's say. If that soil is dropped in, if the water is dropped into the soil and it's not standing, then your soil background NDVI is going to raise up. So it's mixed pixels. And so you'd approach it by trying to separate mixed pixels and also by bringing in indices that more directly measure the water. That's a theory. In practice, it'd be a lot easier if we get out there with the UAVs and collect high-resolution imaging, right? <laughs> Good question. Anybody else? Very cool. Thank you. Yes. I'm Zach Sorry. Simpson. Uh, I work on the Legacy P project, a uh, postdoc here. Um, I was wondering if this, for the Mississippi area, do you see something that's characteristic for how the weedy growth curve looks like compared to, especially at the onset, compared to cover crops? Because I mean, cover crops, it's deliberate. Yep. Person reading. Is there yep. something in that early period that can help yep. differentiate? That's a fantastic question. I was thinking about that this morning. Um, we have not calculated those HLS curves for this year yet because the season isn't done. And so we're not complete to calculate those. 
once we do, I very much intend to make that comparison about whether the cover crop or the weeds behave differently in different seasons. Maybe the weeds come on earlier or later. Maybe the cover crop does better in the spring. Um, maybe there's patchiness in the fields also. We could look at patchiness measures, right? So we're thinking about all of those. Um, last year, when we calculated the HLS curves, we didn't know which fields were bare fallow versus bare weedy. And, and we absolutely will follow that up. So timing is good. I've also wondered if there's a little difference in color between the weeds tend to be a little more red or grayer. So if you had a hyperspectral satellite, I don't think it would be hard. If we're working with these multiband spect spectra that were a little in the question. Yes. Oh, my name is Hemi Lowe. I work on soil and water things here. Um, I'm Mississippi State. So, um, Sometimes like uh, I get it's it's not a question, it's more kind of a, a kind of an idea. So where you were, I guess the baseline is bare, and you're seeing how much cover crop improves from bare. But I would say here the baseline would be weed. Okay. So so I mean we growers intentionally spray herbicides to keep keep it bare. I mean, that is actually an intervention. Not the the natural state. The natural state is very weedy because of our high rainfall, warmer temperatures, and so um, perhaps instead of trying to distinguish the poorly performing cover crop with the weeds, maybe just quantify, you know, the additional growth and NDVI above the weedy, and then that would be kind of uh, what we're achieving from a uh, okay. Conservation standpoint, right? Because okay. um, the head bit will just grow. <laughs> we right. can't really stop it. I mean, we have to spray, and, and so. And does hen bit interfere with corn and soybeans? I mean, hen bit dies more readily. But the biggest, the the reason why people spray um, uh, residual herbicides in the fall is mainly for Italian ryegrass. Yeah, and Italian ryegrass is super aggressive, right. and it's a perennial one so yes yeah. so so i would say that that's i mean people i mean you guys probably have more to say about that about what farmers are doing on the but um there's there's also the common practice of uh airplane burn down in around this time of year january february yeah. so that kills off a lot of Things too, and and maybe that's and they're not going to burn down the cover crops, most likely, or are they? When did when did cover crops get terminated? Uh, some on yeah, some yeah, people, if, will... if it's if it's corn, they're burning down now. Okay, and maybe that's why you're because I was uh, at first surprised by your growth curves because the NDVI was peaking in December, right? Whereas on research, we typically don't want that like we want a lot more of the spring growth like you were sent by the growers in the may but right um yeah we do hear county agents and probably you may know farmers that will try to spray them in january when the rye may be six inches tall and maybe that's why yep. it's not yep. i mean that's not necessarily well now you're getting the balance of why the farmers are planting cover crops. Are they doing it because NRCS is paying them to do it? Or are they doing it because they want to increase their soil health? How are they going to control it in the spring? So up in Maryland, where I'm very familiar with it, there are a lot of farmers who plant cover crops in November because they can under the program guidelines up until November 6th. And then they can kill it anytime after March 1st and they can get $60 an acre for that, right? So in that case, it's a valid planting of a cover crop with minimum environmental benefit. And so I've been an advocate that if you plant late, you can't terminate early. If you plant late, you have to let it grow into the spring to at least have springtime benefits. I think the more you can grow into the spring, the better for overall cover crop impact on the soil and farming system. Um, it's trade-offs, but I really appreciate those comments, and I'd like to learn as much as possible today about the actual farming systems and how people are using the cover crops. How do you even seed a cover crop in ridge till? Can you drill just yeah, the tops, yeah, or is it all broadcast? Something broadcast, yeah. dude. 
There's a wide range. I mean, you yeah. guys probably see a lot on farm. There are people that are, um, you know, drilling after harvest with the beds already shorter, and then they we call them pull metals, basically right. plow the furrows just for irrigation the next year. Right. There are people that will. Um, I've seen a couple of grasses clearly planted in the furrows. And oh, that's usually just to... washed. It's washed in. I don't oh, think it's usually right. planted. If it's with directly planted, they will be laser right grains. Mm -hmm. And you'll see you'll see that sometimes. There were people that were retrofitting uh, mm -hmm. air seeders just to plant cover crops in the furrows. And then the neighbor next door is planting cover crops just on the bed and not on the right. furrow. So people are experimenting. And, you want to comment a little bit more on yeah, on maybe what you're guys doing. Um program manager deals for over here. So um yeah, the methods in which everybody's planting around here vary so much. And when you see that just in the furrow, typically he's gone out there, rehipped in the fall, and he's aerial seeding. And the first mm -hmm. rain that came through put it right in the furrow <laughs> and half of it goes out. Yeah. So I mean you've got so many different variables, but that's just because you're on the front end of it here. There's no standard way that one person is doing it versus another. Ten years ago, was anybody planting cover crops? There was small experimentation by like, some cotton growers that had sandblasting. Yeah. So trying to keep soil down in May when it's so windy and damaging the cotton seed. Um, so just planting grasses in the in the in the boroughs, gosh, and stuff like that. Would you can you just say a little bit more about your program? You yeah, Delta Farm. We basically we're a nonprofit located right here in Stonewall. We work under Delta Council. Um, we focus on getting grants and projects funded through people like EPA, um, NRCS, DEQ. So we take and we basically we may have infield trials that are intensive twenty acre trials. Mm -hmm. where we're doing everything the sweep of every practice you can imagine mm -hmm. or we may be doing a bulk implementation project where we put twenty thousand acres of cover crop on the landscape so mm -hmm. we're semi leading the way as far as implementation right now and um most all your pictures were my trial fields <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We, we know a lot of the answers, but we still have tons of questions. What are your main questions? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the actual formal seminar. Thank you again for coming.